Well, thank you for taking a minute to join me to talk about uh, two historic speeches by Donald Trump. Uh, one on Monday about uh, the grave threat from uh, radical Islamism, and then the one Tuesday on the challenges we face in our inner cities because of the failures of liberal policies and liberal bureaucracies. But before I get to those two speeches, and I think they each in their own way were genuinely historic, and I'll explain why, I want to just comment briefly on the personnel changes because uh, they're a very good sign for people who favor Donald Trump. Uh, Steve Bannon, who's been brought in from Breitbart, uh, is a very aggressive, uh, very solid person who has uh, spent his uh, career as a conservative fighting against liberalism and fighting for conservative values. He certainly understands the media brilliantly, both from his background as a movie director and his background as the head of Breitbart and the work they've done on Sirius XM radio. Uh, in addition, uh, bringing in Kellyanne Conway, who is a terrific pollster and who has a great knowledge of American campaigns and of the American people, I think is going to add additional energy. Uh, this is, uh, despite the news media effort to make all this seem like it's somehow troublesome, this is, these are actually good signs. Uh, the Trump campaign is growing into the size that it needs to be if, it isn't going, if it's going to be a full uh, presidential campaign. Uh, you have to cover 50 states. You have to deal with the national news media. You have to deal with all the challenges of raising money, organizing people, and you have to deal with whatever the Clinton campaign and the Clinton machine are doing. So these are big jobs, and I think uh, the team that's being assembled is very powerful and has a great chance to put together a very aggressive campaign. Uh, and I also want to say, by the way, that I think that Paul Manafort did a very good job of stabilizing the campaign, professionalizing it, and moving it to a national capability. He did a particularly important job in managing the convention and uh, getting a very successful convention. Remember, Trump is ahead at the end of the Republican National Convention and has had a very successful campaign when the news media were all talking about how it was going to be a big problem. So I think that Paul Manafort deserves a lot of credit for having helped get the campaign to this point. And I think that the team uh, that Manafort and his deputy, Rick Gates, and uh, the effort from uh, Kellyanne Conway and from Steve Bannon, that team of those four, uh, is going to give Trump a very strong uh, management group. And I think that's a very exciting opportunity. Now, let me talk about these two speeches and tell you why I think they're historic and why they set the stage for a great national debate in two very different areas, which is part of what made it remarkable. Those of us who have been advocating that Donald Trump give more speeches with teleprompter and more speeches that are written out, thought through, uh, on big topics with big solutions, uh, had to be very excited when he not only gave the Monday speech, which we knew was coming, they'd been working on it for a good while, and they were really focused on delivering it on Monday, but then to turn around because of all of the problems in Milwaukee and decide literally on a dime that they were going to give a speech on America's inner cities, the problem of law and order. Uh, they're going to do it as a teleprompter speech from a written text. And uh, to be told that Donald Trump himself insisted that they needed to have that kind of a text because it was too difficult a topic and too dangerous a topic, given the mood in Milwaukee, uh, to wing it. And so they were able in two days to deliver two very powerful, very effective speeches. Let me start with the Monday speech on uh, radical Islam and tell you why I think it's historic, and I mean literally historic. Uh, <clears throat> we were first directly attacked in 1979 when the Iranian dictatorship seized the American embassy illegally against international law and held Americans hostage for over 400 days. That was the first real salvo uh, in uh, the uh, Iranian dictatorship's war against America. We were then further attacked on a variety of fronts in Lebanon uh, and elsewhere, up through the Clinton administration uh, when we were being attacked at places like Kobar Towers where the Iranians killed a number of Americans, uh, Yemen where an American destroyer uh, was uh, hit by a, a rowboat that, or a small boat filled with uh, explosives, two American embassies in East Africa, and then, of course, 9-11, when uh, 19 
Islamic extremist attacked the United States and killed almost 3,000 people. Now think about this. In the 37 years since the Iranian seizure of the American embassy, in the almost 16 years, I'm sorry, almost 15 years since 9-11, we have never had an American presidential candidate state clearly and unequivocally that this is a global war against an enemy who is essentially ideological, that part of our defenses have to be ideological, that there are great lessons to be learned from the Cold War where we contained communism and the Soviet Union for 44 years from 1947 to 1991, and that we need to adapt some of the techniques, some of the lessons that enabled us to win the Cold War with the Soviet Union to enable us to cope with and then defeat um, the forces of Islamic supremacism. No presidential candidate has outlined as decisively and as clearly as Donald Trump did. A couple big facts here, and this is part of why he's so controversial. He is in effect saying that the entire establishment in both the Republican and Democratic parties has failed. That they've had all of these years to set up a strategy, 15 years as of this September, and they failed. He's in effect saying we need a totally new approach. We need to confront how big our enemy is. We need to confront that our enemy is largely ideological and that we're gonna to have to develop weapons that measure that. That's why what he said about being careful about who comes into America and making sure that they are prepared to accept American civilization, to accept the American Constitution, to be part, to be assimilated into our society, or we shouldn't let them in. Well, nobody's had the courage to reach out and say that, said that boldly and that directly. This is actually a speech George W. Bush should have given in September or October of 2001. Uh, it's just because we have been off on the wrong track this whole time. We have refused to admit that we're in a worldwide campaign against a religiously motivated ideological opponent and that we're going to have to defeat them at every level. He then established a standard which in some ways goes back to Ambassador Gene Kirkpatrick's writing in the late 1970s. Gene Kirkpatrick made the point that when you're dealing with the Soviet Empire and with a totalitarian regime, you should not be as critical as Jimmy Carter was of authoritarian regimes that were essentially pro-American. And she made the point that Carter kept undermining people who are our allies in the search for perfection, but he didn't undermine people who are our enemies. Well, the same thing's true here, and what he's saying is pretty straightforward, that we need to measure countries by whether or not they're with us in the war against Islamic supremacism. And that's going to mean we have some allies who aren't necessarily all that favorable to other values we hold dear, but that we are prepared to have an alliance. So this is not something radical or new. Um, Churchill, a very deep anti-communist, nonetheless was willing to help Joseph Stalin, uh, the largest mass murderer in the 20th century until now, because he understood that Britain's interest of defeating Hitler meant that if Hitler was going to attack the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union could be a useful ally. Not that Churchill was any less anti-communist, and he proved that in 1946 uh, when he went to Missouri and gave a famous speech talking about the Iron Curtain that had come down in Europe. So we're in a situation where Trump is telling us a couple of things that are really dramatic changes. He's saying, first of all, going out and trying to change these countries into modern democracies is an underestimation of, of how deeply they reject those values. Second, in a number of countries, it may be that the best we can do is a dictatorship, that efforts to move beyond dictatorship in the present environment lead to radical Islamist regimes that are actively hostile to us, and that we ought to be very careful about encouraging those kind of regimes. He's also saying that because this is an ideological war, we had better have ideological tools, both strengthening 
uh, our ability to communicate our values and to undermine and defeat uh, radical Islamists, uh, having ideological tests for coming to the U.S. in the sense that if you favor replacing the American Constitution with a religiously inspired legal system, by definition, you're undermining the United States and that we don't have any obligation to accept people uh, to come here who want to undermine the United States. Uh, part of what he means by America first is that America is a unique civilization. We have allowed more people from more countries to achieve freedom than any other country in the world in all of human history. And we shouldn't give up this remarkable constitution and this remarkable system of freedom in any kind of light, uh, you know, multicultural avoidance of any kind of decisions. That's exactly backwards. What we need to do is recognize that people of all backgrounds can become American, that we welcome them if they come legally and if they're willing to assimilate and become American. But we don't want them to come, either A, illegally, or B, uh, if they come here for the purpose of replacing the American system. So it was a powerful speech. It was a helpful speech. He also indicated he would increase human intelligence, which is exactly what we need to be doing. Because going after these guys, this is not like counting the number of uh, nuclear missiles the Soviet Union had, which you could do with satellites. Uh, this requires a lot more in-depth knowledge of who our enemies are. So I thought Monday was pretty impressive. And I noticed that, for example, uh, people uh, like Jim Woolsey, the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency under Bill Clinton, uh, said uh, this speech was exactly right and that what Trump was proposing and what he called extreme vetting uh, was in fact what we did in the Cold War in dealing with the Soviet Union. So this wasn't any kind of revolutionary new thing. This was picking up tools that had worked for us in the past in a very serious and deep competition. The second speech may be in some ways even more remarkable. First of all, where they had spent well over a week developing the speech on uh, Islamic supremacism, they really turned on a dime. Uh, with help from Sheriff David Clark, who is just a remarkable leader in Milwaukee, and with help from Rudy Giuliani, who has the best record in the country of fighting crime, of creating safety, and of creating prosperity of any mayor in my lifetime. Uh, Rudy Giuliani is really a giant in what he's achieved. So Trump had some pretty good advisors for this speech. And he did some things that I thought were pretty remarkable. He is the first Republican presidential candidate that I can remember who went head on in describing the degree to which the failure of liberalism, its failure as a policy, the failure of its bureaucracies, uh, the failure of its implementation at the local level, these are at the heart of Milwaukee's crisis and Chicago's crisis and Baltimore's crisis and Detroit's crisis. I mean, you go across the country, city after city has pockets of poverty, which are often pockets of violence. Remember that in the two days before the policeman shot the man who, by the way, had a pistol aimed at the policeman, uh, a gun that had been stolen in an earlier burglary, uh, and a gun that had 23 rounds in its magazine. So this, this was a legitimate act by a policeman, and the policeman was African-American. <coughs> so it's a little hard to see how it is a racist act when an African-American policeman moves to save his own life, dealing with a man who's pointing a gun at him. And yet, of course, the whole media narrative and the whole left-wing agitator narrative would have you believe that, by definition, if he's a policeman, um, he doesn't count. Sheriff Clark said it best when he said the shooting was just a spark. It ignited something that was already there, something that was waiting. And that something was despair, desperation, anger, resentment, for good reason. As, as uh, Sheriff Clark points out, Milwaukee is the sixth poorest city in America. That came to me as a great surprise. As many of you know, uh, my wife Callista is from Western Wisconsin. My son-in-law, Paul Lubbers, is from Sheboygan. I spent a lot of time in Wisconsin. I'm very fond of, of Governor Walker, who's done a great job, and 
uh, Speaker Ryan, uh, who's doing a terrific job, and, and uh, Reince Priebus, the Republican National Chairman. These are all cheeseheads from Wisconsin, as well as my very good friend Greta Van Susteren, who's also a cheesehead. And it hadn't occurred to me because once upon a time, when I was younger, uh, Milwaukee was a very successful manufacturing city. It was a city of, of middle-class, blue-collar people who worked hard, earned a good living. Uh, it has uh, great institutions. Its Museum of Natural History is remarkable. Its zoo is remarkable. Uh, it has a great cultural history. I hadn't realized uh, how much the inner city parts had decayed uh, and the fact that they were now uh, the sixth poorest city in America. Well, Donald Trump had the courage to address the African-American community head-on and to make <coughs> excuse me, a value proposition that I think is very important. Are you satisfied with poverty, with schools that don't work, with neighborhoods with no jobs, with corrupt politicians who rip you off and then lie to you? Are you satisfied with the rules being rigged so that Wall Street wins and you lose? Are you satisfied with the teachers union blocking your child from going to a good school? Are you satisfied with physical danger? Neighborhoods where people are afraid to walk to church. Neighborhoods where people are afraid to let their children out in the afternoon to play. Or are you willing to think about doing something different? Now, no Republican that I know of running for president has ever offered such a direct, powerful, real choice. I am certain that the opportunity is here for us to have a conversation. Remember that in Milwaukee in the two days before the shooting, nine people were shot and five were killed. Remember that in Chicago last week, 99 people were shot, <coughs> excuse me, 24 died. Now, there have been over 3,500 people killed in Chicago since Barack Obama became president. This is his hometown, and it's Hillary Clinton's hometown. 3,500 Americans killed in Chicago. The answer, nothing. Mayor Rahm Emanuel has no solution. And there's Rudy Giuliani, who reduced the murder rate in New York by 83%, who saved thousands of lives, but the left hated it because it meant empowering the police, it meant enforcing the law, it meant making sure people were safe, and the left would prefer anti-police chaos at the risk of lives to having a strong, effective, respected police force doing its job. And you see that in city after city. There are too few police. They're not integrated into the society. We, we know solutions. I, I helped develop a few years back the whole idea of a police corps to recruit a whole new generation of policemen. We know it's possible because New York City's proven it and Rudy Giuliani's proven it. And yet we lose totally unnecessary number of lives because the left refuses to protect people and refuses to place protecting people at the top. In addition, we know that school choice works. We know that allowing parents to be involved in their children's educational choices increases the parents' commitment to their child learning. And we know the most important single characteristic in learning is whether or not your parents care. And yet, the teachers' union bitterly opposes school choice, even though that traps poor children in the poorest neighborhoods in poor, poor schools. What Sheriff David Clark says consistently are terrible schools that destroy the future of children. So I think Donald Trump may have, last night, begun a conversation with the African-American community, which I believe if it is sustained, and if over the next few weeks it's expanded, and the possible achievements, how do we create jobs? What do we do with, with corrupt, inefficient, incompetent city bureaucracies? What do we do in situations where people have not had a chance to learn? I think in those circumstances, that uh, you could see very dramatic changes in the next 60 days in how African Americans view their future. Because for the first time, they have somebody offering them a genuine, bold choice. Uh, Chris uh, Thomas says, do you think the polls that the media is reporting are accurate, or are they playing with the numbers? Well, I think it depends on which polls you're talking about. Look, 
the news media has done everything it could to suppress Donald Trump. Uh, they, have, they have emphasized the negative. They have avoided covering Hillary Clinton. Uh, they have uh, nitpicked anything Trump did. Uh, and Hillary Clinton has spent, to, with her allies, an estimated $110 million in advertising attacking Trump in the last few weeks. So some of the polls for a little while showed Trump fading and Hillary gaining. On the other hand, the Los Angeles Times just came out and shows it a one-point race. Uh, Zogby came out this morning and says it's a two-point race, 38-36. I'm not very worried, um, and I recommend uh, to everybody a, uh, a book that came out uh, called Whistle Stop, which is a study of uh, the Truman campaign of 1948, which I'll do a future uh, Facebook Live talking about because it's a fascinating book. But just remember, Harry Truman was so far behind in September that Roper, the famous pollster at the time, said he would no longer do any polls because it was clearly all over. Uh, news media said, uh, Truman's so far behind, it's sad that he's even running. He ought to just give up. But he went out. He did exactly what Trump did last night. He told the truth. He stuck to the facts. And if you'll notice, both of Trump's speeches, both the speech on Islamic supremacism and the speech on the tragedy of the American inner city. Both of them are filled with facts. And I think that's going to be a distinction. I think you're going to see Trump focusing on piling on with fact after fact after fact, while Hillary hides and just tries to use emotional language. Uh, Jean Marie uh, Rosano says, um, Trump's poll numbers in Pennsylvania and Florida are dismal. Hillary is leading by a large margin. Does he have a chance to sway these voters? I don't worry about August, as I just said. Harry Truman was so far behind. You know, the pollsters were off by the closest poll in 1948 was nine points, and the worst one was 20. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about it right now. I think that Trump has a very good chance of carrying Florida, a very good chance of carrying Pennsylvania, and I think speeches like last night begin to make a difference. Trump going into inner city Philadelphia and offering a better future could have an amazing result because the truth is, no, no Republican has ever had the courage to offer African Americans face to face, go to a large church in central Philadelphia. Now, I predict if he does that, you will see enormous demonstrations against him because the left wing activists cannot allow a Republican to have a genuine conversation in the black community. They understand this is a mortal threat to their power and they will do almost anything to stop him. Um, Brian Swayze says, will Mr. Trump continue reaching out to African Americans, maybe to inner cities or churches? Uh, I thought what he said directly to them was wonderful and needs to keep happening. <coughs> well, Brian, I mean, you and I are just exactly on the same path. I believe this is a very, could be a historic turning point for America to finally have a serious businessman who is not intimidated by political correctness, who is not owned by the teachers union, who is not emboldened, who is not responsible to the local city bureaucrats and the bureaucrats' unions, to have him stand up and say, we can offer a better future, we can offer a safer future, we can offer a future with jobs that pay, we can offer you a chance to have your family live in a safe neighborhood. I think all of those things are extraordinarily powerful and, and could work. Um, Parth Pandya, this is the last thing I'll answer today, but Parth, I think it's Pandaya, Pandya, uh, says, what else does Trump need to do to gain more voters in November with his campaign? He needs to do two things. He needs to stay as disciplined as he has been the last 48 hours because it's remarkable when he doesn't give the news media something to hide behind and they have to actually cover what he's saying, how powerful his speeches are. Second, he needs to take a series of topics. Uh, how do we rebuild the inner city? How do we uh, create safety in America? What do we do about replacing Obamacare with a better health system, with better outcomes, with more cures? Uh, how do we uh, rethink education? I mean, there are a whole range of things he should talk about, and he should have the most idea-oriented, solution-oriented campaign in history and contrast it with the degree to which Hillary Clinton is owned by the teachers' unions, owned by the government employee unions, owned by the liberals, and incapable of having serious new reform thoughts. So I think this is going to be an exciting time, and I think one of the real turning points 
was these two historic speeches this week, and I thank you for spending time. And remember, uh, at Gingrich Productions, uh, we do two free newsletters every week, so you can see what we're thinking about and talking about if you want to go to Gingrich Productions and sign up for our newsletters. And you can also see there all the other different things that we're doing uh, that you might find interesting. Thank you very, very much.